I am Dr. Tamar Sechkin from New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, warm welcome to you all. I recognize you all, our virtual conference with tremendous excitement since we went through an unbelievable year with COVID. We named this conference as the truth is on the march and nothing will stop it. In fact, something stopped it. And that was, that was unfortunately COVID. We never had anything like this. Yeah, unfortunately COVID bring us the COVID mortis. While we were searching for endometriosis, we met COVID mortis. Actually, corona mortis is something that is medicine where epigastric arteries connect to the obturator vein. There is an anatomical position there. I wanted to mention that since we, we this is about corona, it was an interesting meet there for me. Um, something happened and science was the winner. Science preceded the politics. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit, this is our 11th meeting and I'd like to acknowledge my co-founder, Miss Padma Lakshmi. This is a picture from our first ball when we had in 2009. Padma has a lot to do with our foundation's initiation. She basically brought it to the visualization throughout the world. Through her courageous uh, uh, discussions about her own disease, which is in public where I had been part of her surgeries and her story, she was the first one who really started to talk about her internals with courage, like Betty Ford did about her breast cancer 30 years ago from that. So endometriosis found sig significant, uh, significant um, recognition. And I must say that since we started the movement with the foundation, there has been multiple multiple uh, endometriosis centers opened up, research increased, and I must say many physicians have more courage to, to, to go after endometriosis like they never did before. Right now, the foundation has done significant progress. One of the key progress has been, we have donated $1 million for, the, for research, a couple of our research awardees, uh, was qualified for more millions of dollars of NIH grant. And on top of it, one of the key achievements, I must say, our high school program got recognition in Albany and there is a bill New York State passed as recognition of endometriosis as a disease associated with menstruation and high school kids will learn it. We aim to uh, spread this throughout the nation. Well, this is a picture from our first, uh, first uh, ball we had and Harry was recognized. He didn't know that was a surprise for him. Today, he will be part of our presentation team. I am joined by esteemed faculty and speakers. Uh, this is a two day conference and the first day we're gonna cover Uterine, uterus, extra pelvic and cancer and neuropathy and our keynote speaker and the recipient of Harry Rich Award this year, Dr. Arno Watiev will be joining. But before that, I introduce my, uh, my moderator, Dr., Dr. Dan Martin, Dr. Rich, and I'm not sure if he is here, but Victor Gomel. Harry is in Florida, Dan Martin is in Washington, and Victor Gomel is in Vancouver. I like to have, more importantly, before we continue, my department chief, Dr. Frank Charmonak, the world-renowned ethicist, the man of moral, 
and good-hearted person ha has extended his help and assisted throughout his life to everyone. I want him to say a word because if it wasn't his support, maybe we couldn't do, I couldn't be doing much of my practice at, at uh, Lenox Hill Hospital. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Tamar, good morning. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome everyone this morning to this moment of beauty in this troubled time. Um, all of us, I know Tamar, myself, everyone on this webinar would rather be meeting in person so we could share the wonders as we did in past years and Tamar, hopefully next year, we'll meet in person to celebrate. But I, I think it's wonderful that we're doing it this way in these challenging times. A special word about Tamar Sechkin. I am the chair here at Lenox Hill and uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very proud of this department and I'm especially proud of Tamar Sechkin. He is the classic triple threat. He's a brilliant clinician. He's a brilliant researcher and a brilliant educator. Um, I could go on and on of what he contributes, just not to the patients. He uh, helps people from throughout the world. He trains our young doctors and he's putting new knowledge forward. Please, I wish every doctor in the department could be like Tom or Sechkin. He's a role model for everyone, for all of us. And Tom, I'm so grateful to you for what you've done at this challenging time. You've brought together the best people in the world. Some of them have pioneered uh, endometriosis surgery from the beginning, some are newcomers, but you brought together the best to assure that anyone who is calling into this will be enriched and will be better able to care for their patients. So without further ado, I welcome you all. I congratulate you for being part of this. Tomer, go forward. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Chervonak. I uh, so we we should we are officially starting our uh, conference. The as you know, the the first day is divided in, into it's a two hour session, and the first hour there will be a, a there will be a um, Dr. Philip Conix from uh, from Belgium will be starting with pathophysiology of endometriosis and Eriko Zuppi, we're gonna cover his, his talk with questions asked. Uh, and um, then there will be again, uh, Dr. Tolandia Nezat, and we have recorded presentation of Dr. Watia and his award ceremony. And then we're gonna go for peritone. We're gonna do all these things, believe it or not, in the next two hours. So. I like to introduce Dr. Harry Rich for his um, contribution to uh, endometriosis. I don't think anyone who does laparoscopic surgery in the world who does who is not familiar with Dr. Rich. It's his his uh, his first hysterectomy in uh, 1988 or 89. I met him later, a couple of years, maybe five years later in Hawaii, then we became friends. But throughout that, I can tell you, Harry Rich has been the power of um, spreading the word endometriosis and laparoscopic surgery, especially in the world. And um, many young doctors, including many young doctors, including myself, has met these giants, Dr. Ray Gary, Bruja, uh, Kurt Sam, uh, and Frank Lofer years ago. And here we are in Belgium. This is 25 years ago. Arno Wattier is sitting right in, across me. That's the first time I met him. He was Bruja's student. How much he, everybody respected Bruja with his I am hearing more and more from Dan, Dan Martin. But Harry was an incredible man that really tra traveled around the world. He, I learned stitching from him that nobody else ever did like that. You, nobody put that curved needle inside. And he was incredibly 
meticulous with hemostasis. And these were the, still the most important aspect of laparoscopic surgery. I also would like to recognize, if he's not joining us right now, Dr. Victor Gomel. He is also one of the giants. He'll be one of the panelists later. Microsurgical techniques that he introduced in concept and practice has been the key of laparoscopic surgery that really prevents adhesions and, and directs precision in the best way we remove these disease. So without further introduction, I like Harry the, uh, start talking about his piece, which was in my life, I saw it all. I reviewed the video, fantastic. Unfortunately, due to time constraint, we cannot present, but I want him to talk about why he presented the pieces. He has shown his abscess case and very difficult bowel case that he started. Actually, Harry is the first one that I, I know that used the stapler in bowel late 1995. Harry, please um, join us right now. Thank you. Thank you. Here I am. You are on. I'm on? Yes. Thank you. Anyway, I want to thank you. It's, it's unbelievable that we've gone uh, two years without seeing many of you because of this pandemic, which is terrible and continues terrible. I haven't gotten a vaccination yet, but I hope Many of you have started on the vaccination uh, for this condition. But anyway, uh, the title of this, this whole day is about uh, reoperative endometriosis. So in the videos that I presented, I presented the first one was what happens if you do have uh, a late complication, namely uh, uh, perforation of the rectum, which happened in this case day, I think it was day eight after surgery, after what I call uh, skinning of the bowel. First of all, let me say that from the early days, I was excising endometriosis and especially endometriomas thinking that was a key. And later on, I discovered that wasn't the right solution that the cul-de-sac was more like it. And just separating the rectum from the vagina helped in many of these cases. But some of these cases recurred and we went back in these cases and excised the, the nodule, usually on the back of the cervix or the back of the vagina. And it wasn't until around 88 or 89 that we started being aggressive toward uh, the rectum. But really endometriosis to me is a rectovaginal disease. I mean, that's where it lies. So between the uterosacral ligaments First, you start with the uterosacral ligaments and then what's between. So that's where the disease lies. And the rectum is there, believe it or not. We're gynecologists, we're, not, we're taught not to go near the rectum, but I think the time is present where we have to be better trained. And as Arno will emphasize, we have to become pelvic surgeons. That means excising the rectum if it's involved with the disease. And in my second case, I show a case where not only was the rectum involved, but also the sigmoid. So we did a sigmoid resection through uh, the rectum for the first time. I think the only time, I haven't heard of that technique since. But anyway, that's why I don't present these things at meetings or journals. I mean, but you'll see the video and uh, that should give you an idea of what we did. Uh, Tamir, uh, for, I'd like to say it's, it's great for me to see Victor Gomel here and uh, Felix Connex. And I'm really looking forward to Arno. I think you, you, you will see Arno's whole ta uh, tape of his case, which uh, not only his case, but his philosophy which is similar to mine. I think unlike Dan Martin, who we're very privileged to have as the, the medical director now of the Endometriosis Foundation of America. Uh, so really we have, besides this great organization that Tom here started, now we have a medical director who's respected worldwide. So we'll talk about this stuff, but 
for me, I'm more like Arnaud when he talks about find the disease, see the disease, excise the disease. Uh, as far as the uh, microscopic portion, I'll let Dan talk about that in more detail. But I think endometriosis is a lesion that causes the pain. It's a lesion that's surrounded by fibromuscular tissue. And the key to it all is the fibromuscular tissue, which is easy to see and easy to grasp and easy to excise. Well, not easy. I mean, it can be quite difficult going way deep into the pelvis. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, okay. Dr. Dr. Martin, you may have some question. We have to engage some of the questions that may be directed to Harry since he has a different and solidified vision of certain things. Uh, do you have any questions that coming from the uh, audience? So we're watching the question. We're watching the questions right now. None have been directed to Harry at present. Uh, Thanks. We do have one. Let's see, I'm getting echo, which, where's my echo coming from? I can't figure out where the echo is coming from. Anyway, we do have one regarding the $26 million. The question was about 63 million. I wish that were true, but it's about the $26 million I, I, I will, grant. I will, I will answer that if you don't mind. Okay, uh, go ahead, yes. I think the amount is totally incorrect. Foundation never gets money from the government. Foundation do not get any money other than small amounts in the past from any, uh, any insurance company or any other pharmaceutical. So the amount of money that's been authorized this year through our also effort among others is 26 million. And that money is going to NIH directed uh, uh, research. So let's clarify that. So foundations, uh, economical income and every paper that's related to its finances can be found. It's very transparent. It's in the website from until 2019 included. You can go and check it there. Anyone interested? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Harry, here is a question that you can answer. Some women after endometriosis surgery, even after a resection of everything that is seen, still have pain. What can they do about pain after they've had surgery? Uh, I have very little experience in, in that situation. Most of the time, if I could find it, the endometriosis with a, an exam, and I emphasize a good rectal vaginal exam, you could usually find where the patient hurts. And that's the area that you concentrate on during your surgery. And if that area is excised, in most cases, the pain will be relieved. If it isn't, uh, I, again, <laughs> uh, I'd send her to a pain specialist, I guess. But uh, I'm an endometriosis. I, I was an endometriosis excision specialist, not a pain specialist. Thank you, Harry. Thank, thank you. I think for time-related issues, we, we need to move on. And I'm going to move on to Dr. Philip Connix who has a beautiful video in our website and in our server. It's about the pathophysiology of endometriosis and adenomyosis for clinician. Dr. Connick says there is a need for a valid contemporary understanding of endometriosis since the standard as endometrium like glands and stroma outside the uterus is old, about hundred years old, a century. So, he thinks it is very outdated and it does not validate all the clinical presentation. Dr. Connix, you have the floor. Thank you, Tamir. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, my friends, all, all there. I'm not going to list you one, one by one. Do I give a talk of three minutes or can I show a video? Three minutes. Five slides. Minutes. Thank you. We're going and then there will be questions. Yeah, just, just five slides if I share screen. And that's it. Share. You're going to see many of these things I have been, been discussing 
for years and, and, and days with Dan Martin and with Victor and with, uh, okay, all, all the co-authors, but what for the audience I would like to, to, to specify. Uh, facts and hypothesis. An observation that an apple falls down and ever falls in the other direction, you make a hypothesis. And with time, you refine, you find other observations. It remains valid in terms of one observation does not fit. And if you need more than one hypothesis, probably it's not correct. I have a problem with macroscopy and microscopy. Everything it does is only thing you can say it looks like and then you go from the body to the organ to the tissue to the cell cell machinery epigenetics and then you have more like a biology dna epigenetics cell machinery and this is an impression and this we still don't know about and and the materials that's where things are coming together the definition of as you said i mean is 100 years old and it's not really valid. It's not always pathology. The Samson's implantation theory, this is the second thing. Today is history. I think we can forget this because it does not explain metaplasia. It does not, it's incompatible with clonality and it cannot explain a lot of things. All what is association, association can be, endometriosis can cause changes in peritoneal fluid and all these changes can cause and and the material or you can have a common cause this is the reason why together with the quarters uh, we published genetic epigenetic means it remains and the medium until something changes and at that moment you could call it endometriotic disease what is driving this is oxidative stress I'm not going to dwell on this, but probably infection. And you have to remember that the inside of the peritoneum is outside the body. It's like the inside of your mouth, it's outside the body. There's no vascularization in the inside, it's, it's outside. So this is the whole story of the microbioma, which means that it comes to this as a story, inherited defects. This is including endometrium, infertility, pregnancy problems. These are the causes what causes during life more um, mistakes. And then you have a lesion and each lesion is different. And if you have 10 lesions, you have 10 different clones. And each lesion is different. And some have proge progesterone uh, resistance, other estrogen uh, production. The nice thing for the clinician, and that's the two last slide I want to show. We could go to prevention, less pollution, less oxidative stress, less blood in the peritoneal cavity, maybe antioxidant, maybe manipulating the peritoneal microbiome. And you see already there, you have the story of food intake and exercise, which manipulates the microbiome. And it's the first time I begin to understand that this could help with endometriosis. So these are the hypotheses. Oral contraception helps on all the levels, antioxidant, food intake, and exercise. But if it's benign tumor, you have to do surgery. But where it's challenging, since if you cut half a meter of bowel or just excise the nodule, recurrence rate is the same. I only can explain this is the periphery of the endometriosis is some kind of fibrosis of, of met metaplasia. Maybe it looks like that, the metiosis, and it's also the same thing with for oncology. But this means that our surgery in the future should be much less aggressive than we are used to do. That's it. That's the message. Thank you, Dr. Connix. Uh, Dr. Martin, is there any questions um, pending or in your file for Dr. Connix or related to this talk? I must remind all our viewers that we do not have to cover all the questions. We have in our roster 150 questions. It's even hard to, to, to categorize them, but we're trying our best. But 
trust me, the, we will try our, to answer those questions after the meeting separately by our special effort. Dan. Yes, I'm, I'm reading the questions right now to see if, if someone has sent one to Harry, I mean, to, uh, to uh, Philippe. Uh, Okay, Philippe, I don't find one specific for you, but here's one that crosses over into both endometriosis and adenomyosis that may be a, a reasonable question. Someone's been diagnosed with adenomyosis and wants to know what that means. And could you answer that with respect to how are adenomyosis and endometriosis associated with respect to the theories you just discussed? Women are born with some kind of genetic epigenetic defects. And during, which means that if you already have some predisposition and you have more likely to have additional um, risk of both adenomyosis and both endometriosis, which to a large extent are very similar conditions. Not that only different by location. But uh, the condition itself, I think, is the same mechanism. Okay, Philippe, here's a specific question from our, from our champion Togus, Talandi. He wants to know what type of food do you mean that women should or should not take? That's a good I, 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 I didn't hear the question. I didn't understand. You mentioned food in your presentation. Okay. Um, Food, I know it's very provocative when I say this. It seems logic that uh, antioxidant should be helpful for endometriosis. It's logic. If I look at the many, 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 many papers which have been published uh, about food and endometriosis, it's more than to say this myth is not true. They come from India, they come from China. Uh, there are a lot with concombers. There, there, there are a lot of data that food is doing anything. I always have been thinking, how could could food do anything for an, an, endometriosis? But I was surprised during the literature on the microbiota in the peritoneal cavity that food intake is going to change the microbiota in the peritoneal cavity, as does ex exercise, because it manipulates the microbiota in the bowel. And there's some kind of transmural uh, progression of uh, the bacteria, the microbiota is going to go transmural and affect the peritoneal cavity. So the nice thing about this is, is that the day we understand it comes together and, and I think it, it becomes logic to look closely at food and to do nice randomized trials for this in order to know what helps for does, 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 does not help. I must say, I'm starting to be interested in the Indian Chinese literature exactly for this. Thank you. Thank you. It's time maybe. <laughs> okay, there is a question. I think I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Gomel. Someone last name Marx is asking you, what are the ways of minimizing adhesions and scar tissue following a second surgery. She's not mentioning about the first surgery. Apparently she's going maybe for a second. She's afraid it may come back again. Dr. Gomel, this is your field. First of all, I would like to say a few things about uh, you. You know, you are a phenomenon. And I have always said that. The way you have taken, first of all, endometriosis as a sole specialty, the way you have created a foundation and you are talking in millions of dollars, I mean, this is a fabulous achievement. I thank you, I congratulate you, and I'm very proud that you invite me here. I am honored. So coming to the adhesions, 
what you have to do in the first surgery, it's exactly the same as the second surgery. You have to use exactly the same principles. And for me to tell you all the principles will take a lecture. But I can give you, I can give you, if you want, uh, places to look at. Fertility, sterility, from laparoscopy to laparotomy to IVF. There, you know, you see all the principles you can find that we worked on to diminish additions. And the first, first thing uh, are uh, very gentle surgery. Thank you, Victor. Thank no, you very much. To take the time, but you know, these are principles, and there are many of them. Doctor Rich, do you have anything to 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 add or say about the adhesions after surgery? Well, you know, there's there's all kinds of things that people discuss about adhesions. And uh, my thing was always to use Ringer's lactate. My solution to pollution was solution. So I would leave uh, 2,000 cc's Ringer's lactate in a peritoneal cavity at the end of every case. And I believe that uh, that has a, a, a hydro flotation effect and that it markedly reduces the amount of adhesions that uh, one will get after surgery. Harry, there is one question popping out. I, you can talk about it for hours on this, but this is a good one and well positioned by Amy Jane Melhush. Uh, I do not know where she's from, but interesting presentation, Dr. Rich, I watched it. Would love to hear yours and the panel's views on pros and cons of robotic or not surgery when considering your feeling the disease, another haptic feedback, versus being able to visualize microscopic disease with robots. Well, and, also, and also she asked, she continued, there's another question following this. What do you think about ex excision version versus ablation? We know the answer, but you can say it. Go ahead. Well, you, uh, you know, I don't know that much about uh, ablation other than you know, every now and again, you size the major lesions and there's still a little area, a few areas of endometriosis that will ablate, especially when I was using the carbon dioxide laser. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, what, what, as far as the first question, what was that again, Tamir? The, the first question was, uh, um about robot, the, the role oh. of robot, and what do you think about robotic surgeons place in endometriosis surgery, particularly because it's an issue of haptic feedback that really we rely on in endosurgery. Well, you know, I found that feel was always very important for me. I could feel where I could feel normal peritoneum and I could feel deep fibrotic endometriosis inside the peritoneum or on the peritoneum. And I could grasp that and excise it. And uh, with a robot, I can't do that. I mean, as far as whether I could see more endometriosis with a robot, I'm not sure about that. Remember, I started with without video cameras. I used my eye. We all started that way. Pardon? We all started that way. <laughs> not today, not today. <laughs> but we did, you know. Uh, you, you know, most general surgeons who do uh, any, any of the bariatrics or any of the other things use video right from the start. But for us, Victor, we started with our eye. So we had a look with our eye and uh, th then we came upon the beam splitter. I used the beam splitter and I didn't trust the camera, even though everybody else in the OR saw on the screen what was going on. I, I didn't believe it, so uh, I continued to use the beam splitter. When I did the first hysterectomy, in fact, I was looking through a beam splitter, so I did most of it with my eye. 
sometime uh, around the early 90s, I started using the video more. But uh, I think uh, the, the robot, according to the literature, you see even more than you can with uh, looking at the sharpest video. I, I have questions about that because, again, I haven't much experience with the robot, but I, I see what people are doing with their uh, video, especially with the, now that we have 3D video coming upon us, and uh, they could see the whole pelvis, they could see the lesions quite nicely. I, I, I'm not convinced that the robot really offers anything, and uh, I do, do like the saying that I've heard from many others, that it seems to be training wheels for the laparoscopic surgeon. Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much. This conversation and discussion about robot, again, can go on and on and on. I think, I also believe there are good robotic surgeons coming, coming up. It really applies very well to direct hysterectomy and myomectomy. And some people are doing good surgery with endometriosis too, but I think it's a matter of who's on the driver's seat and what kind of vehicle they're driving. So we have to move on. And we, but there is one question that we will delay about to Eriko Zupi. Eriko is not feeling well and could not join us today, uh, but it's about adenomyosis and OSADA procedure. The person is asking, why don't we do OSADA procedure? I will delay this question and answer later, but it's a good question, but we have to move on with the extra pelvic endometriosis and panel. We have, we are joining by Dr. Togas Flandi and our good friend, Dr. Farnezat from New York City. Togas Flandi is joining us from uh, 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 McGill University, uh, Montreal. And Far is probably very close to where I am right now in New York. Hi, everyone. Hi, Togas. Hi, Far. Hello. Nice to have you today. So, I think I will start with um, with um, uh, Togas's presentation. He he goes after uh, something we know that ovarian cancers are uh, common after the tubal uh, tubal reverse uh, trafficking the cells, you know, uh, drop to the peritoneal surface. We know that association. We know the rate. But Togas is making interesting points more the endometriosis association with tubal cancer and adenomyosis. Togas, you have the floor to please to restrict as, as short as possible because there will be question popping out and Far is also gonna talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tamar. Uh, it, it's great to be here with you guys, although virtually. And of course, uh, I'm happy to see all the friends, Harry, uh, Victor and Dan. Uh, basically, we did a study, and it's a, a large epidemiological study looking at the association between endometriosis and ovarian, which already uh, described before, and also we look at tubal cancer. Uh, and we found that uh, endometriosis is also associated with tubal cancer. When we also look at adenomyosis now, Philip mentioned about adenomyosis. Um, and we found that even adenomyosis, to our surprise, is associated with tubal cancer and uh, ovarian cancer. Now, I don't want to make everybody nervous, but the, the incidence is low. It's about one in 10,000 women. But in the presence of endometriosis, uh, the incidence is higher. Uh, and also, but the good thing is if a patient has endometriosis, well, the bad thing is they get cancer earlier, but the prognosis is better. It looks like it's better. I'll stop right there and then I'll answer questions if there is any. There's a specific question that's coming to you, Dr. Cholande. Do many of your patients first treated by endometriosis return with ovarian or endometrial cancer? Yeah, we, the, the problem is this, this database is a large database. It's not longitudinal. So uh, it's just a trend. Uh, so we, it's not that Mrs. Smith is being followed for 20 years or so. It's not longitudinal data. So it's just a trend. So I cannot answer that in the, uh, 
specifically. Oh, there's a question about family history of ovarian cancer. Uh, what is the increased risk of ovarian cancer in women with endometriosis? And can you do that both in relative and absolute risk? I don't think we have the answer. Um, one thing we know that endometriosis is, uh, is familial. In Montreal, we look at it, it's about 8%. Um, in UK, it's about 7 8% as well. So there is a familial uh, tendency of endometriosis. So maybe it's also, uh, there's a familial tendency of endometriosis and ovarian cancer. We don't have the answer. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Nezat cannot wait to take his turn and address some of these questions also. Um, uh, Far, you can, you can actually, I'd like you to summarize your fantastic presentation in a couple of words. As you all know, Dr. Nezat is one of the few GYN oncologists whose interest and focus on endometriosis, which we don't really see much. GYN oncologists usually typically run away from endometriosis. They really don't want to see because it, for them it's waste of time and uh, it's difficult. So far is special in, the, in that regards. I think um, she, he will address some of the uh, questions. He actually in his talk, treatment and screening options and available for women with endometriosis. Far, the, the floor is yours, go. Morning, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Tamer, for kind invitation to be part of this distinguished uh, faculty. There are two issues. One issue is uh, if the patient has genetic alteration, you have to clarify it uh, between the family, history, or genetic alteration. This is the most important thing to know. Either the patient, the background is genetic alteration to cancer or sporadic cancer. Endometriosis, as you all know, it is an inflammatory estrogen dependent disease. And the baseline of the malignant transformation of the cells are three things, is estrogen, inflammation, and somatic alteration of the endometriosis cells. But it means that endometriosis cells already have some molecular alteration. So they are one step closer to become malignant. And if you add to it estrogen and also inflammation, which is the hallmark of endometriosis, make this lesion to have tendency to become malignant. So the same way that endometrium has potential to become malignant, and we have endometrioid adenocarcinoma, we have clear cell carcinoma, we have serous carcinoma, we have a stromal adenocarcinoma, and triple MT or malignant mixed mesodermal tumor of endometrium. The same way the endometriosis cells, either in the ovary or on the peritoneum, on the bowel other areas could become malignant. That is a simple background. Now, if the patient does not have any uh, germline genetic mutation, the incidence of malignant transformation, as Dr. Turandi mentioned, it is low. It is maybe one to 2% higher than general population. In the same time, we have to realize that if you have different type of histology of epithelial or ovarian cancer, majority of them are high-grade serous carcinoma. Then the next one is endometrioid, and then the next one is clear cell and undifferentiated. High-grade serous carcinoma it seems coming from fallopian tube from fibrillated end of fallopian tube. 
that is one of the biggest discovery that we have made in recent years that epithelial high aggressive uh, carcinoma, the origin majority of them is not ovary, it is fallopian too. And that is the reason that we have not been able to find a good screening test like ultrasound or CA125 to find this cancer earlier. However, endometrioid and clear cell carcinoma coming from the ovary and those backgrounds seems to be most of them are endometriosis. And it is very simple. You have endometriosis that already has the cells have some molecular alteration. They have high level of the estrogen in the ovaries or even endometrial implant itself has high degree of aromatase activity and produces a lot of estrogen. And of course it has inflammation. These three together makes this lesion to become malignant. Now, we know that the patient that they have germline molecular alteration. The most common one is BRCA1, BRCA2, yet and other uh, molecular alteration. We call them the next group are Lynch syndrome. That there are four different protein abnormalities and some other one, the rare, rare one. Those ones they have higher chance of the ovarian cancer, which are most of them are uh, high gerosterous carcinoma. For example, the BRCA1, which has the highest number of the uh, potential to develop ovarian cancer is about 35 to 40% that this patient have potential to develop ovarian cancer. So if we are suspicious that this patient has one or two people in the family have ovarian cancer, these days we are doing germline blood tests or saliva genetic testing. And if the patient has this alteration, she has to be consulted by a genetic counselor and be advised to have ophorectomy for BRCA1, we advise them by age of 40, BRCA2, age of 45, to have ophorectomy. And hopefully by that time, they have had their children. Thank you, Dr. Neza. Thank you so much. There is one question actually directed to Dr. Ihan. Dr. Ihan is in Japan. She is sleeping most likely. It's three o'clock in where she is. So that question will come to you guys. Is there anything endometriosis patient need to advocate for in terms of tests and procedures to risk ovarian cancer? It's an, and also I will add my question to you. In your private practice, when patients request prophylactic uh, uh, ophorectomy with history of ovarian cancer in the family, it is actually justified. It's an elective procedure. Do you do peritonectomy of the anti-ovarian surface? Two questions. Please help me to answer it fast because we have to move move on. Thank you. Dr. Maybe Nenna, I'll Solandi, yeah, maybe I'll you? yeah. I think the implication of our study is, uh, I think we have to increase vigilance in women with uh, history of endometriosis. If there is something suspicious, I think we have to be more aggressive uh, in these patients because there is a slightly risk of ovarian or tubal cancer. Um, the other question is what again, uh, Tamar? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. The other question is in surgical practice, does it make sense when you do ophorectomy? We, we know salpingectomy is prophylactic. When you do prophylactic ophorectomy, do you consider taking anti-ovarian peritoneal sidewall as much as, as abnormal you can see, visualize, or you just leave it? I tell you what I do, I remove, but you go ahead. Usually I remove, I remove the ovaries and if there is a, uh, lesions uh, on the sidewall, I remove it. If it's normal, I don't do anything, of course. 
Maybe Far can in, uh, elaborate more. Far. If you do prophylactic uh, salpingo-forectomy for patient who has genetic alteration, the most important thing is to evaluate the peritoneal cavity to be sure there is no gross abnormality. Any gross abnormality has to be biopsied. And then we do peritoneal washing. And then we remove both tube and the ovaries. And the pathologist has to do serial section of the entire fallopian tube and also the entire ovary because the patients that they seem to be have normal tube on the ovary, histologically, they could have up to two or three percent of macroscopical cancer. For the peritoneum, if it is abnormal, yes, any abnormality of the peritoneum has to be biopsied and dissected, but not normal peritoneum. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin, do you have any questions on the Slack? online live question coming. How do you approach surgery in this day and time of COVID-16? What do you do to protect them? Do you think they should all have vaccinations? What other concerns do you have? Uh, well, good question because we don't well, have the answer, but uh, number one, my surgeries are being canceled. Um, I, do mi I do minimal during the COVID uh, because all the nurses are deployed to COVID's ward, but um, I think vaccination is important. Um, I think everybody should get it if they can. Well, in our hospital, we, we make sure there's a COVID test 20, uh, 48 hours prior to the procedure. And there's no visitors, there's strict guidelines. Even in private ward, they don't accept any visitors. So our surgical schedule is moving on, but this is New York, it's not California. I do not know what tomorrow brings. So far, we're lucky. We, I'm sure Far had also, I had my first vaccination and the second one. Second one was extremely, uh, it made me sick for a day, but I feel lucky. I'm even embarrassed to say that I got mine because we do surgery. However, uh, we, I think uh, we have to protect patients and strict guidelines with distancing and the mask is a must and will be strictly followed, I'm sure, in the next 100 days in, in New York or the rest of America. Um, yeah, all patients before surgery uh, should, uh, should undergo COVID tests. And if it is positive, of course, we cancel it. Uh, but everybody should have COVID tests the day before. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we are getting close to... Um, uh, our main speaker and, and the keynote speaker, I'm sure he is somewhere in the um, uh, speaker's room. Uh, we're looking for Arno Watier. Um, I, I like to really run his, his video first, uh, recorded video, then we will recognize him. Um, or we should recognize him now, Harry. How do you say? How do we go? Let, let's say hi to Arno. I mean, it'd be great Where? to see you. Hi, hi, everybody. I am listening to you since a while, you know? Okay. <laughs> hey, oh. you're looking good. Yeah. So, Arno, before you came, we, we were uh, talking about a lot of things, and your name was there. We mentioned you, and um, this is a picture that I shared. I don't know if you guys see this. Do you see this picture? Yes. Ah. So we, you, this is the first time. Yeah. This, is, this is Brussels 25 years ago. Harry says you look younger than anybody else. And he's talking to you and, and you know everybody here. And this is Brussels exactly 25 years ago or 23 years ago. Um, Certainly there's Bruja on the right-hand side. Harry made sure I put this picture there so your memories will be alive. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have to introduce Arno as someone that I met very early. I'm very, uh, I, I regret very much when he was in Strasbourg, I never went there, but 
we did follow from a distance wonderful teaching, basically teaching and great surgical technique uh, that he followed. I'm sure he he's also like me is affected by Dr. Rich. And I know they were very good friends. And since then, I like Harry to take over and say a couple words before we present this award to him and we will listen to his presentation later. Arnaud will be the uh, recipient of the Harry Rich Award simply because the foundation stands for the advancing the science and surgery of endometriosis. We believe surgery is the key treatment, whereas other things, all medications are management. There is a difference and the role of surgery because of drug company policies and everything else cannot be put under the table. We want to bring it to the front and keep it there, but quality surgery, precision surgery, surgery based on tissue diagnosis and, and leaving and, and removing as much as possible, but not too much. Arnaz talk about not, not removing too much and be careful about that and wonderful other things. Harry, please take over. Well, well, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to both see and hear Arno. Uh, I met Arno in 1985 when I was looking for somebody else in the world who did laparoscopy. So I, I heard about what they were doing in Clermont-Ferrand and I went there for a couple of days and I saw the whole situation, how, how the whole system. I saw how it evolved. I saw great surgeons. I saw Arno uh, move to Strasbourg and become the leader in the world of endometriosis surgery. And now I guess he's in, in a very famous place in Dubai with a new center. And uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, see him here. We have a lot of memories and I, I don't wanna discuss them too much, but uh, I think we'd all be better served by Arno's talk and I must say that I believe everything that he says. We go to your um, presentation. I like to read the Endometriosis Foundation of America had a rich award for pioneering work in the science and treatment of endometriosis. Arno Watier, I'm sorry, it reads March 14, 16, 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it is. I want to do over, over, uh, overnight this to you to uh, to Dubai, but they, I was warned that there could be delay and you may not be in your hands. So this is it. I'm sure. Do you guys see this? Yeah. And it will be in our notes and this week. Thank you. So Arno, would you like to say a couple of things before we go for your presentation? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm first of all, I'm very honored by these uh, these awards. I mean, uh, for many reasons. Uh, the first reason is the name of the word, which is Harry. And as you say, Tamer, Harry uh, marked uh, my life, my professional life, but also my personal life. And, uh, and so, as he said, we met in 85. Uh, at that time, I was more, more driver than a doctor. And uh, I tried to entertain uh, Harry under the direction of my boss. And I tried to, to make him safe in, uh, in our, our very, very remote region in France. And, um, and from that time, I remember that uh, uh, doesn't matter the place, doesn't matter the building, doesn't matter the technology, what, what is important are the people. And so uh, thanks to my start in this remote region, I still get the chance because I think that under the direction of our boss, Professor Bruja, we, we did a good job and we were recognized worldwide. So that's why I met uh, Harry and I met uh, also Cameron Nejat at this time. And so that had definitely changed my career and uh, helped me to, to work better and to understand better the needs of our patients. So, I'm very glad to have this award because Harry is behind this. So Harry, officially, I want to thank you for all you have done for me. And uh, you're, you are one of my mentors, if not the most important mentor. 
Uh, in addition, you have a very good friend. And so uh, with emotion, I thank you. And uh, as you say, we have, we have incredible memories. And <laughs> it's, always a, it's always a pleasure to share that. And all the people in the panel here are all my friends and we work together since so long that we have also incredible memories. And Tamer, thank you to, to, for the, the endometriosis organization of America to, to award me this. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the guy who should get it, but uh, I'm glad to get it. And, uh, and, and that's it. So as you said, and, and I was listening all your discussion and, uh, and I think that this is not a close story. So we have a lot of things to discuss, which are a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit antinomic, you know. And uh, if we speak about cancer and speaking about conservative surgery is a bit, you know, antinomic. So we have to really be sure about the message we want to deliver. But uh, surely I know that those patients need help and as you say, surgery is probably a part of the help, but should be done uh, by profession. And this is, the, this is the, the, the aim of my message. Thank you again. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is a, a real honor for me to be here and to share with you uh, some of uh, my experience. And finally, now that I come to a certain age, uh, some results about uh, the management of deep endometriosis. And uh, this is an honor also to, to have been nominated for, the, for this uh, prize that uh, I will get today. So uh, I will start my, uh, my talk, which is uh, uh, excision without mutilation. It is possible. And you know, uh, I have a quite a large experience, so I have no disclosure uh, to declare on this, uh, on this talk. And uh, you know that I, I really feel that concerning endometriosis, the real progress would be to move from seek care to prevention. And this is all what we try to do with a better uh, early diagnosis by imaging. And we have done a lot of uh, uh, progress on this. Uh, the markers that can uh, detect the disease uh, even earlier. And then from this early di diagnostic to make an early management that will avoid the surgery. So I know that this is a, a little bit strange from a surgeon to promote the non-surgery, but you know, and we all know that uh, uh, the, what we see from the disease is like this picture, beautiful picture, the cyan part of, of the iceberg, and we can offer to our patient a lot. But the disease itself, uh, it's obviously invading the quality of life of the patient, but also can play a role uh, on the, on the uh, uh, let's say, the degradation of the well-being of the patient. So uh, when, uh, when you look at this, and I like this uh, article to say that the damage may be due to the disease itself, but also to the surgery or to the surgeon. And so I mean that uh, that's why it's very important to talk about the disease, the knowledge, the techniques and also the training and the experience of the surgeon. So when we talk about treatment, we can balance. And I think from my knowledge, this is the only uh, uh, disease where a patient with the same symptoms can go to see a medical doctor, an IVF doctor or surgeon, and she will get three different answers and proposal to, to, to treat the same disease. So I think at some point that we have to look at what we do and try to be a little bit more uh, focused on the patient. So medical uh, treatment has some side effect, is always contraceptive and probably just uh, suppress the disease until the patient quit. And we have the problem of the compliance with the treatment from our patient. Surgically, we know this is aggressive, risk of complication, adhesion, et cetera. 
So uh, what we know first is that endo and deep endo affect the quality of life of our patient, and there are a lot of data. I, I share a few, uh, one, one with you, but we all have this experience that we have a patient that have tried a lot of things that come at the end to us. And if you take the general consideration that we deal with young patients, and this, this disease is not a cancer, and most of the time, as those patients are young, we speak about fertility preservation more than uh, infertility, and we have the risk induced by surgery. So those are the, the main problem. And uh, uh, so the, this is not a cancer. I want to stress on that because, and this is really uh, your fitting with my talk, you know, in cancer surgery, you can be very aggressive and you can also obtain some mutilation because at the end of the day, this is life. But, but endometriosis should not be, uh, surgery should not be uh, compared to cancer surgery. And I will come back to this. And then, uh, and, and so, for example, uh, we do not need clearly to obtain the optimal cytoreduction that we need to have for cancer, okay? And on the other hand, there is no safety margin. So to do a large resection for a small nodule is not either recommended. And so we have to stop to say, ah, oh, endometriosis surgery is exactly like cancer surgery. It's not true. We go to the same space, we have to deal with the same organ, but we should not do the same. And so I think this is the first thing where we should not mutilate patients for endometriosis. And at the end of the day, we know that surgery well done is very efficient. And again, we have a lot of data. I share with you one, but we have much more data. And you see that coming from people and my data shows also that we are uh, drastically reducing the pain when we do this surgery. So it means that we should do the surgery and probably not the first line therapy we have to, to indicate it. But when we come to surgery, we have to tailor the surgery. And tailor the surgery means to be radical to the disease and to be strictly conservative to the function. And so, and above all, in this story of endo, we have to respect the patient requirements. Again, same article. So if we want to respect the requirement of the patient, it's not enough to be on the right place at the right time, but you also have to be the right person. And so when I, when I say, and this is the first message of this talk, so if we want to do a proper surgery without mutilation, we have to be the right person uh, in, uh, on, in face of the patient, on face of the patient. And to be that, we have to get a special training. And so we have many problems to, to answer, should we operate or not? Uh, when we operate if we do? How to operate if we do? How we preserve the fertility and how we preserve the function? So the risk of operation is very well known and it comes to the ovarian reserve. And you see here, for example, in this picture, the left ovary have been operated, the right not, and you see the difference. So we know that we are ovarian reserve predator and we have to pay attention. We are also adhesion maker. And so adhesion provider and adhesion are not good neither for the function or the fertility. And so if you operate, you risk to provide adhesion. Now, if you do not operate or if you operate badly, you can come to a full uh, uh, cul-de-sac occlusion, obliteration, etc. And so that can be due to the adhesion from the disease that we let uh, going on, or it can be due to the addition provided by the surgeon. So this is also the risk. Now, if you do not operate, this is what can happen. And here, this is a very young patient, 27, and you see the two big tubes, masses on the side, right and left, are not the bowel, they are the ureters. And so this patient, we have to do an extensive surgery, bilateral reimplantation, and we just save only one kidney. So that means that we have to to, to make decision. And when it comes to young patients, you know, we have always to say that probably we should not be too aggressive early, but also if we are not, we have this uh, famous centralization of the pain and, and the pain is not in the head, it's in the brain as we know. And so we probably have to reconsider the risk of chronicization of the pain before we say, no, we don't touch. 
And so again, benign disease, young patient, fertility preservation. And for fertility preservation, we have a lot of art techniques and oversight pickup and freezing, frozen embryo, frozen ovarian tissue, probably uh, in vitro maturation of immature follicle that come. And so, but also we can discuss partial surgery or better, in my opinion, economical surgery. And this is the point. My point is we have a very challenging disease. My point is that it affects many organs. So I mean, that is not only the problem of the gynecologist, is a problem of the colorectal surgeon, is a problem of the urologist. And I, I prefer myself to combine all those competences in one, like we do for oncology in gynecology. But you can also work in multidisciplinary settings, but it means that you have to discuss and the patient should see all surgeons that have to understand. So you have to deal with ovary, vagina, intersacral ligament, but you have to deal with ureter, vessel, bowel, and nerve. And so we have the challenge. And the challenge is major postoperative complication. And I don't speak about fistula, bleeding, hematoma. I speak about bladder, bowel, and sexual dysfunction, post-op, or de novo adhesion that impair fertility. And so I think that we should not mutilate our patient. And when you come to mutilation, it's because we produce or we induce some uh, uh, dysfunction that will make that even if the patient is better in pain, if she cannot empty her bladder, this is a problem. And that we have solutions. So it means that we should probably not over treat patient and some have done, uh, but we should also certainly not under treat patient, which is also opening the door to iterative surgery. And so that's why I say we have to be radical, but economical. And you know that the, the period is uh, very favorable to a lot of small phrase like this. That's why I promote do uh, make less being more. And I will give you two examples. And I think the way to non mutilate our patient is to do the job, but making less, uh, making less, uh, uh, damage by knowing better and at the end we do more for the patient and so i give you two examples i will give you the nerve and i will give you the bowel i cannot do more because the time i have is too short but if you remember that the nerve sparing concept have been developed in the early uh, 50 and late 50s by japanese uh, laparotomists for preserving nerve in cancer and preserving them in early cancer where you know, taking out some tissue for staging was important, leaving inside uh, the, uh, the nerve uh, intact. And so, unfortunately, and we have seen recently that a lot of surgeons start to dissect the nerve for endometriosis and develop concepts like nerve sparing surgery for, uh, for endometriosis. So we have a problem here because what happened, we have seen a lot of useless dissection of nerve from the the superior apogastric plexus to the inferior apogastric plexus with a result that we damage the nerve. Or if you look this beautiful slide coming from the, the work of Vincent Anaf, you see that when the nerve is involved by the disease, is intrinsically involved by the disease. And so when you see this picture, you understand immediately that this nerve is not dissected. And so what I want to show you also is this beautiful normal anatomic nerve. So two, two reflections. Don't touch this nerve because you see the beautiful vascularization, the beautiful uh, freedom of this nerve, you know, uh, being free under the peritoneum. So this nerve, everyone, every single surgeon can dissect it. When it comes to endo, it becomes impossible. So either you have two choices. Either you cut the nerve, and so you should answer to the question, what happened if I cut to this patient? Or you can let some disease behind, and this is not a cancer. And so I mean that we have a lot of data on nerve dissection, and we know that this is very deleterious. So you mean that we have a decrease the flow for a value of 74 grams when you stretch. Imagine the force we apply with our instrument on this, on this uh, nerve to uh, when we dissect in, uh, in the nerve. So to conclude with the nerve, there is no uh, 
no more nerve sparing surgery uh, that there is ureter sparing uh, hysterectomy. So I mean that if the nerves are involved, we cannot dissect them and we have to discuss if it works to remove and to be fully aggressive to this patient or if we can let some disease behind. Alors, obviously, if the nerve is not involved, don't touch the nerve, but don't even dissect it. So if the nerve sparing concept in endometriosis is to dissect all nerves to see if they are involved, I think it's very deleterious. The second example I want to give you and share with you is the bowel. Bowel endometriosis. So we know since very long that the optimal treatment for endometriosis is excision. We know it for the peritoneum, we know it for the bladder, we know it for uh, even the ovary, and, uh, but we know that we have a pay to price. But all, only in uh, uh, bowel we discuss a lot of options. So we have the shaving, we have the disresection, we have the simple adhesiolysis, and we have the segmental resection. And people are challenging. So most of the people say shaving is enough, and, and this is probably true in, in some occasion, but we have to understand why. So we are gynecologists with less experience in bowel surgery and the colorectal surgeon have a poor knowledge of the disease and certainly no knowledge of the patient. So we have this problem and so we should solve it. So either we make uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, in oncology tumor board where everyone knows about uh, the, the disease and knows about the surgery and knows about the patient desire or we make transversal competences uh, to solve the problem. So, I think that one statement, large total mesenteric excision for benign lesion are no more acceptable today. And I think that we should claim that, and this is very important. And by the way, so I mean that is a, a gynecological input. So when you can do shaving, and I think that again, this is like the nerve. If you choose, there is no no one that tell you that you have you should be in CCR zero like we say in oncology, and you can leave some disease behind. When you do a shaving, you have to accept the fact that, as it has been shown in the work of Remorgida, if you do a shaving, you will probably let in four, more than forty percent of the case disease behind. This is acceptable, but you have to know that and you have to consider it. Now, what we have done with gynecology, huh, we have done. Here you see, this is a bowel that has been removed 15 years ago. For a small nodule, you remove 30 centimeters of the sigmoid. And now this is what we do today. Again, sorry, this is what we do today. We do that. For this tumor, which is about 5.5 centimeters, we do a 5.5 resection. You see, we are exactly at the edge of the tumor. And this is, uh, uh, this is what we have done. And this is the gyne input on the matter. And how we did that, you know, we look at this. So look the technique, shaving discoid segmental, and look, radicality versus function. So shaving, probably not radical at all, but function is better, is good. Discoid, more or less radical depending on the size, but function is still better. Segmental, radical, and question mark, what is the function? So if we can answer to that question mark, we have the solution. And the answer is not easy because obviously if we continue to make total mesenteric excision you, and with ileostomy, with dissection of the left angle, I mean that the patient will pay the price with bowel dysfunction post -op. Now, if you know the anatomy and the technique, and I think this is not so big, you know, when I was doing oncology, I was doing bowel resection. So now when I do, when I do uh, uh, endo, I also do bowel resection. But I understand that it's not possible, there are privileges, et cetera. So no problem, we can work on team, but you know, we should, we should still that you have three space. Posteriorly to the rectum, you have three space that, you know, determined by two fascia, the presacral fascia and the fascia propria of the rectum. So you have the presacral space, the interfascial space and the transmesorectal space. So when you do benign disease, what you do, it's you do a transmesenteral excision. So you dissect the rectum between the bowel wall and the fascia propria of the rectum. And it's not easy and you will recognize, if you don't do that, 
Here you are between the fascia propria and the presacral fascia, and all look all the main branches of the nerve. Here you have the sacral root, you have the hypogastric nerve, and you have the splenic pelvic nerve. And you understand that if you cut a sacral root, you are going to denerve all the segment that depends on that root. And now you understand that if you're on the uh, transmesenteric plane, all the branches you will get are just for the segment you reject. So you understand that there is no damage postoperatively. And I think that you have, we have to conclude. So if we go to economical segmental resection, for example, they are effective, safe, and radical. So I mean, we answer to the question of the patient. But in addition, they have the follow-up and they are associated with very low uh, post-op dysfunction. So we understand that sigmoids are different than rectum, and we can we can we can tailor what we do more discoid and shading on the rectum and more more uh, resection on the sigmoid. But you know this is what we 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 have learned. So in conclusion, when I say uh, we have a lot of challenges in that young patient, and we should certainly not mutilate them because they have a long life in front of them and they need all their function to achieve their life with all this desire. So we have to replace the concept of radical surgery by economic. Economical, do, economical doesn't mean to be less radical. We can be radical and economical, it's just a matter of knowledge and training. And then we have to develop this economical radicalism by this better knowledge of the disease the patient requirement and the anatomy. And then we have to revisit the concept of nerve sparing because I think that it has been a deviation of the, a deviation of the, uh, uh, the goals. So I mean that everyone now starts to dissect the nerve for no reason. And I show you that the dissection is deleterious. And so we have really to try to focus on patient objective and that's why endometriosis is very interesting because as this is not a cancer, we should not behave like, like oncologists. And when I treat uh, uh, an ovarian cancer, I know that if I let one millimeter of the disease, I will impair the life expectancy. And so I will not, but not in endo. In endo, if you have a patient with endometriosis and no symptom, you do not treat. And I think this is what we, what. Uh, we don't want to have patients without endo, we want to have patients without symptoms of the endometriosis, and this is where. So we have really to develop this new subspecialty, pelvic surgeon, endometriosis surgeon. I think that we have to address better the problem of our patient. And this is a slide that I love because, you know, I defend surgeons since very, very long. And uh, I think that to be a surgeon, you have to get a lot of of those uh, quality in me, I think creativity, curiosity, imagination, courage. I think courage, and especially for endometriosis, has to be really high. And you see that ability is just a small part. So don't believe that you have to be a buyer. You have to be knowledgeable. And you, from knowledge, you have to understand. And then from understanding, you will go to intuition. And so I think that this is very important. And we have to use all these uh, uh, quality to turn them towards the patient uh, problem and the patient objectives. And if we go there, I think we are, uh, we are going to, to, to treat our patient much better. So I think the concept to make less more is based on knowledge and training. And I think this is a very important concept that we have to develop. Alors, I know that the uh, surgeon have an ego, but sometimes we are probably to put something on our ego and to serve better the patient. So again, I thank you. I thank you for the honor. I thank you. I hope that I give you some flavor. We can discuss the ovary. We can discuss the bladder. We can discuss everything in the same way. I think we are here to serve patient. And I hope that uh, this is what uh, you, uh, my message delivered to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wadia. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Um, certainly, uh, you are absolutely right. If the patient is asymptomatic, you shouldn't touch it. Certainly, if there is no 
no complaint from the diaphragm lesion. You don't need to go there and cause more problems, certainly, and other things. Um, you also say that the real progress in endometriosis treatment would be to move from sick care to prevention through early diagnosis. Now you got to elaborate on that, can you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 it's obvious, you know, when you see and when you see the surgery, you know, the problem, it's a, it's a vast discussion. And that, Dan Martin is here and I know that he exchanged with me some emails sometime and, uh, and for example, I start to say, you know, you have to respect the patient objectives. And we have to recognize that uh, uh, sometimes those objectives are either uh, difficult to realize or, or to fulfill. And, uh, and uh, I just refer to one patient I operated three days ago, so very recently. And uh, when I saw the patient, I told her really, what you need is an hysterectomy and probably a bilateral oophorectomy because the, your situation is such that uh, uh, she was 43, she has kids, she, she, but she said, no, no, I don't, want, I don't want my uterus removed. I don't want the bowel resected, etc." And so this is what uh, Dan called uh, probably the, uh, the personal autonomy. And, uh, and we have to respect the personal autonomy and understand that this is a ph philosophical discourse since uh, the 17th and the 18th century. But, but in, the other, in the other hand, this personal autonomy goes against the political economy, uh, autonomy that uh, we are facing nowadays. And so I obviously respect the patient desire knowing that this is not good for her. And so I think that what would be better to not come to this dilemma, which is impossible to solve, because honestly to do, to do something that you don't believe efficient is difficult for a surgeon. And I really that we face sometimes this problem. And that's why I really think that to avoid this dilemma, which is not only philosophical, but human, I mean that we have to move a little bit ahead of this. And if we can obviously find a way to, to diagnose, and I know that, you know, well, in Europe it's said that the, 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 the time between the onset of, the, of the, the symptom and the diagnosis is nine years. I know that uh, Dan will say 14 years uh, in average, but I mean that, uh, uh, I think that if we can make the diag diagnosis earlier, because endo start one day and then grow and then become more severe. And so some patients stop earlier in their severity, some patient goes more severe. But, but I think that if we may have, a, a, probably this is more in the markers or in the genes, the genetics on the risk factor, and we may have a way to contain the development of the disease. Obviously, this is better. So I think it's a very trivial uh, thought. Uh, when you look, when you look, you know, I think that we can do a lot surgically. Yeah, we we can do a lot surgically, but also there is thing we cannot do. I mean, uh, there is and Victor is there. There are things that you cannot repair. Okay. So I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, no, Cla clarify your answer about early diagnosis. Do you mean earlier surgery or earlier diagnosis using some non-surgical technique? No, no I, I really feel earlier diagnosis, not, not using any surgery. I really feel that, I really feel that we have, I don't know if it will be markers of the development of the disease. It will be genetics on a risk factor etc. But it means that I really feel that we have to prevent the growth of the disease. Because, uh, uh, you know, I, I, as a surgeon, I do not feel that the problem is the disease itself. The problem is the reaction of the, uh, um, the human tissue to the aggression of the disease that makes a problem. And so when, when, we, when we operate patients, you know, we operate patient and we find this famous frozen pelvis. 
And the frozen pelvis is made for what? A little bit of disease and a lot of adhesion and fibrotic tissue and reaction of the surrounding organs. And, uh, and that's it. So I mean that if we can identify a patient with risk and from this patient with risk, the patient that will start the disease and if we find a way to contain it, I think, I think really this is what we should do. So sick care is good. This is what we do. I am a sick care doctor, but I would like to better for those patients uh, honestly, again, what I say in my presentation is strange from a surgeon to, to promote to not do surgery, but I think that this is really what we should do. Because, you know, honestly speaking, in some cases, uh, to, to be at the same time uh, conserving the function and treating the disease is very challenging. And so probably if we, if we, if we be a little bit in front of that, it will be better. Yes. You stated that 40% of patients af after limited excision have residual endometriosis. Mm -hmm. There are patients questions that are coming up about why would you leave that much endometriosis behind? And the corollary question is going to be if a patient still has bowel symptoms six to 12 months after the removal of a large nodule, what would you tell her about the probability of residual bowel disease and how it can be approached? Yeah. Yeah I, I, yeah, I know your question, and this is a, an excellent question. So it starts like this. So I mean that uh, I know you speak about the uh, Horace Roman work showing first that you have micro implants at distance of the big nodules, and this is, this is true. And, uh, but the, the first statement is to see if you have non-symptomatic endometriosis, no one treated. And so I mean that uh, the small uh, two millimeter implants or less uh, probably doesn't bring any, uh, has no clinical significance at the time. So, but it, that said, it could evolve and eventually could become symptomatic and I understand that. So I think that when you treat patient with, with endometriosis, whatever, bowel, bladder, ureter, whatever, I think we have to be prudent and to say, look, uh, we cannot eradicate fully the disease because for those reasons, we know that, uh, first of all, if we want to remove all, probably we are going to affect your quality of life in terms of function. And two, that probably there are lesions that we cannot see, palpate or whatever. And so, uh, and so we are not going to be able to, to remove everything. And there is a small risk of recurrence of evolving of remaining disease. And that, that I think this is just a matter of discussion. What we want from the surgery is to bring back patient to a good quality of life. And so doing so and probably leaving, uh, leaving the two millimeter nodule far away from the big nodule I show you will not, uh, will not uh, affect our life. And to be honest with you and to come to the end, because I, I know about this question and I look at my, in my, in my follow-up, honestly, I never have seen a recurrence after bowel resection in my theory. So it means that probably we have left behind some nodule or micro nodule at distance, but they never express clinically anything from, from, from you know, Honestly, honestly speaking, some of my patients could have gone elsewhere to get proper treatment, but, but it's not totally true because most of the patients are, uh, are very keen to come back to you. And so, but in my experience, I, never, I, have seen, I have seen recurrence after shaving, and that I have seen a lot. And I have reoperate patient after shaving to do bowel resection, that happened but I never have re redo a bowel resection after a bowel resection. So, but it's imperfect, huh? You know, from your discussion before about the risk of cancer, so now you can ask even the question if this is uh, correct to let uh, an endometrioma <laughs> because it's less than three centimeters. Yes. Thank, thank you, thank you, Arno. I, I can't agree more. I, I personally did not have 
any recurrence of bowel after bowel resection too. However, due to fibrosis maybe, it is the, some pain comes back, even you, you look back, you don't see any, anything but fibrosis most of the time. Um, the question really is, is not the, what we feel and what we remove as masses, but the challenge of peritoneal endometriosis. As much as it is dismissed, peritoneal endometriosis really represents significant percent of the patients who have endo and their complaints. That has no imaging techniques or no other uh, test other than patient's history and pelvic exam, highly suggestive. So when you go back, obviously in general, there's with these cases, there's a high rate of recurrence compared to others. So uh, when you really say that uh, we have to detect early, yes, but then how do you approach it? I think the audience would like to hear when patients are symptomatic and you don't want a surgery, what's your first line of approach? I, in my practice, do birth growth, this and that. So basically suppression of the ovulation and, and, and periods. But when do you think that's the optimal to intervene? Obviously the patient has the autonomy. And uh, I think you also pay attention to, to a symptom directed approach. Uh, I like to hear your, your sentiment on this, if you can. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the challenge with, uh, with endo in young patients for two reasons. One, because uh, as you say, the problem is the time to intervene. And so, and this is difficult, but I think this is, this is not the most difficult thing. The most difficult thing is that those young patients would like to be pregnant when they will desire it, which is not now. I mean, this is really the fertility preservation. And so, and fertility preservation and early management, surgical, early surgical management sometimes are antagonists. And so that's why we, we all, we all uh, are hesitating to do surgery on young patients. So I think in my, in my opinion, like you, if I have a patient with uh, pain, mainly because it's a main symptom, and I don't speak about the, let's say, the, the, the dysmenorrhea of the young lady, but really abnormal dysmenorrhea and pain. And so, which is not supported by a clear imaging of endometriosis, like you, my first line therapy is medical. So it's medical, whatever you want, uh, OCP, progestin, whatever you want, more OCP, but let's say, uh, this is a uh, suppression of the ovulation and suppression of the period in case of dysmenorrhea. And that this is classical. Now the problem is when you have a young patient with those symptoms, which are supported by a clear imaging of deep endometriosis. And this is where, in my opinion, the, the problem starts. Because then now you have a young patient with clear endo in imaging, clear deep endo, and fertility preservation. And you, well, you have the problem of the ovary, but you have also the problem of this deep endometriosis. And so I think that as I told in my, uh, in my talk, so that we have a lot of questions. The first question is, okay, uh, do surgery, remove the deep endo, leave behind some adhesion. What about the fertility, etc.? Fertility preservation, oversight retrieval. The, the, can, that all can be discussed. And, uh, and uh, in the opposite, if you manage it medically uh, and you are not efficient, you have the risk of the chronization of the pain. And so uh, that's why the, the, the discussion on the young patient should be really tailored case by case. And uh, as you, I think uh, the, most, the, the, the highest number of patients I see are patients that already try a lot of, of treatment and, and are still with the pain. And I think that when the pain become unbearable, become untreatable medically, it's time to do surgery, even if you are young. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'd like to move on, but I, this, is, this question is important. 
I want Victor Gomal also pitch on this uh, question. Actually, it's directed to Zupi about uterine surgery. I'm sure I know where you are. Uterine preservation for fertility is a big deal. And as we discover more and more diagnosed adenomyosis with extensive use of MRI, they're reading more and more adenomyosis. When they're small, no problem. But when there's a diffuse adeno, I mean, surgery, you can do the surgery, but there is a limit what you can say and promise. I want to hear your experience. And Victor, please, the question is about really like this. Thank you for this information regarding adenomyosis. One treatment option is I did not hear mentioned is the OSADA procedure for diffuse adenomyosis. This procedure is rarely done, especially outside of Japan, where it was developed and where the majority of adenomyosis surgery are performed. Why do you believe this procedure is so uncommonly done? And why do you believe it is worthwhile for endometriosis adenomyosis specialists to learn how to do this procedure in order to offer patients with diffuse adenomyosis more treatment option than conserve the uterus for pregnancy? Well, Sada, is, who's willing to ask? Victor. Sada is a friend of mine. Uh, I uh, actually uh, did uh, in Japan a microsurgical course in 1981. So he was there and then, you know, we have been together. When he was uh, doing the article to publish his technique, I couldn't understand the writing. So I was in Japan, I went to Japan and he showed me several videos and I, I understood why and how the procedure was being done. And I helped him actually with the article. So this procedure he does, you know, he's a very good surgeon, first of all. And he also, because you see microsurgery was not uh, created to use small instruments. Microsurgery was to how to uh, decrease adhesions. And I can, I can tell you about that tomorrow because today we don't have much time. So the OSADA procedure is done when there is extensive adenomyosis. So that, and to be able to keep the patients with some sort of good wall of the uterus and give them the possibility to have a pregnancy with that uterus. So it's not for smaller lesions or confined lesions. It's for extreme uh, adeno adenomyosis. May I comment on that? Or... Yes, 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 by all means. Yeah. Uh... Victor, I agree with you. Alors, the, the, the OSADA technique, uh, first of all, I, I want to say that when we deal with, uh, as you say, diff, diffuse adenomyosis, no focal, no whatever, and then it comes to uh, resection. What we observe when we do the OSADA technique of the, the, the identic technique we have, that we have an excellent result on symptoms pain and bleeding. And that, that is totally correct. And we have patients that are, at least for the few years after surgery, happy because they have a normal life. When it comes to pregnancy, I want to be a little bit more prudent uh, because uh, what we have observed is that one, the risk of rupture is much higher compared to myomectomy. And two is much earlier compared to myomectomy in the pregnancy life. And so it's said that myomectomy, the highest peak of rupture is 32 weeks. Uh, in, in, in adenomyosis, uh, surgical treatment, it seems to be 25, 26 weeks. And so I, I want to say that we are lacking data and on my knowledge, one of uh, uh, an uh, randomized trial on the OSADA technique has been stopped 
for bad result, obstetrical reasons. And so I yeah, you are right. You are right. And actually, the number of pregnancies he had after, uh, you know, in the in the publication, you you can see that uh, were very limited. Uh, I, I do not agree, uh, Victor, because they published forty percent of pregnancy. So it's I not it's not, it's not limited. Limited, limited, going to term. Yeah, no, no, but I, I, I want to say that adenomyosis, the surgical treatment of adenomyosis is, is, is like endo, is very challenging. In one way, it's very, uh, you, actually, you want to do it. In my opinion, it's much, uh, much more with extreme uh, adenomyosis, is much more challenging than um, even sometimes endometriosis. Because you don't know what to do, uh, you are shaving, taking tissue. No, but I, no, but really, I, I I want to say, the literature is quite optimistic. Uh, I think we have to be a little bit prudent, and I would suggest that this kind of surgery is really followed very closely, because I'm not sure that. Uh, the results are so good in terms of obstetric, obstetrical outcome. No, no, I totally agree with you on that because you are uh, effectively destroying the, even the shape of the uterus. Mm. Yeah. You know, okay. I mean, this is this is evident. But you know, we have today other means to to use uh, pregnancies in places that. Uh, that it's permitted, you know. Mm -hmm. I have been very interested with uh, the uh, uterus. Um, Victor. Yeah. So and, and you know, I, I have even written an article on it. Uh, so sometimes instead of doing a uterus uh, from other other person which is a terrible operation you know it is Thank better you. to have uh, the person who is undertake that surgery to be the donor to carry the pregnancy it's, it's, easy, it's easier and less risky thank you thank you victor thank you so much I am sure uh, the audience was pleased with this answer. My take on adenomyosis, I, I mean, I, I, I do hesitate. I have done the procedure. There are patients who still want it, but not for, for uterine pres preservation. They are adamant, fine. But however, there is no guarantee of the obstetrical integrity, as you say, the rate Absolutely. of is Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So we will, uh, gentlemen, we have to move on. It is, uh, we have one more session, but, and, but we will not be late. Dr. Passover, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Usta, and Dr. Le Min Shin's um, uh, section, which designates our commitment for the neuropathies and neuropathy surgeries and the molecular level of adenomyosis and peritoneal endometriosis. Unfortunately, Passover has a problem. He promised he would be online. He's not, but uh, I, you know, his his, his uh, video is online. I watched it. It's uh, terrific, very nice as usual. And um, he says basically, pelvic pain can persist following endometriosis surgery due to neuropathy and cause of number of symptoms. And he really goes over all the symptoms and understanding the cause of pelvic pain following endometriosis surgery to offer patients the right diagnosis and treatment. That's where the neurosurgery comes, he says. Listening to the patient and carefully reviewing their medical history is essential to understand their pain. I don't think anybody disagrees. Please go to our database in the foundation. You can, you can load this video and watch it at your convenience. Uh, let us know if you have any problem. Second talk was given by Dr. Usta. He's a young surgical talent from Istanbul, Turkey. 
I was very, very impressed with his presentation. He has given four cases, uh, basically most of them on vascular entrapment of the nerves, in, which is rare, but he declares that it is an important cause of pelvic pain. You have to write MRI people reading that, obviously. Considering that pelvis is an anatomically co complex area, this part of the, of the pelvis is rarely taught. It's a, it's a tiger's, real tiger zone and, and uh, difficult to navigate, which we all agree. We are lucky to have Dr. Lemin Shi online with us. You see here, I think yes. I was, Dr. Shi. Hi, could you hear me? Yes, I do. So let me introduce you, Dr. Shi. Dr. Shi is the Tolin Professor of Pathology at John Hopkins University. She works with Dr. Iham, who is the pathologist at Osaka and also John Hopkins. He has written multiple articles at the molecular level. In fact, we have an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine with respect to malignant mutation in otherwise benign endometriosis lesion. This article was game changer and has been getting a lot of uh, positive response still. Dr. Shi, would you uh, just basically uh, summarize what you, you, you did make your talk about? I know it, pathology of adenomyosis are unique on non-malignant GYN disease, but tell us more. How do you achieve this much of research? And then uh, what is your route of interest? Where do you think things are going with these research? Monoclonality, when does monoclonality of the endometriosis changes and what is the pr practical value for future? Maybe I asked too many questions, but that's all I want to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a great uh, pleasure to be online and um, uh, to participate in this uh, symposium. So basically our laboratory and our research team at Johns Hopkins is very interested in uh, where are this adenomyosis and uh, endometriosis coming from in terms of their ancestors. So um, as you know, our laboratory is basically a molecular genetic laboratory in studying gynecology cancer. So back to cover uh, several years ago, uh, we are really inspired by this endometriosis foundation and also uh, many colleagues in the, in the field. So we think one more uh, deep question in endometriosis, how can we apply cancer research tools and in order to understand adenomyosis and endometriosis. So as a result, uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, many colleagues in, in the field and uh, including Dr. Seshkins. And so we try to understand uh, what's the mutation profiles in a genome wide level and uh, how can uh, this new research data uh, help us to understand the origin. So as a result, we include several uh, deep endometriosis, and uh, nowadays uh, we include adenomyosis and the peritoneal endometriosis alike. So we use a laser capture microdization, which is a machine that we can isolate and enrich epithelial cells or the stromal cells from individual lesions. From there, very minute uh, lesions, we can purify the DNA and we can perform a mutation analysis to analyze 22,000 genes in the human genomes. And uh, at the same time, we can also profile epigenetics, uh, their landscape in these lesions. So basically, briefly, epigenetic is the modification of the DNA. It's not inherited, it's not like a mutation but it has a very uh, powerful effect on gene expression and other biological functions. Okay, so uh, based on the analysis of somatic mutation, and uh, we try to infer the phylogeny, just like a family tree, and uh, to see, uh, to compare the utopic endometrium and uh, adenomyosis endometrium, and also peritoneal endometrium, uh, likewise. And we can show their relationship is really complicated. 
So in my talk, I try to deliberate that uh, the detailed results, but the upshot is um, the adenomyosis and the endometriosis, the epithelial cells, basically they can be traced back to their utopy endometrium. So that means that adenomyosis and the endometriosis are related to the utopic uh, counterparts from the same patients. And why this is uh, interesting is because about uh, one year, one or two years ago, uh, Dr. Moore uh, group uh, published in Nature, uh, their group using a very similar technique to isolate normal endometrium in the, uh, in the uterus. And then they, uh, amazingly, what they found is uh, the normal individual endometrial glands also harbor these cancer driver mutations, like KRAS, PIK3CA, and AR1A, and et cetera. So that means that adenomyosis and endometriosis harbor the mutation can also be found in the utopic normal endometrium. So what that tells us is one thing that uh, very, very clearly that adenomyosis and endometriosis arise from the utopic endometrium at some time point during the uh, productive cycles, but we don't know when. But at least there are several years from the, the symptoms arise. And uh, based on the mathematical modeling and the estimation, uh, we now know that probably the, the first mutation hit occurs in right after the puberty. So that means that the, their ancestors of endometriosis and adenomyosis actually developed uh, many years ago uh, from the symptoms start to appear. And also we apply epigenetics, which is the, um, uh, the first kind of uh, this kind of research. And we found that actually the methylation profile are very similar between uh, among this adenomyosis and the endometriosis lesions among uh, women. But there are certain uh, profiles that are different that can be distinguished from the normal endometrium. So that can become a biomarkers in the future for early detection as, as we just discussed uh, previously. Uh, so that's our lab is going to uh, harness this new genetic and epigenetic biomarkers to develop something that we can uh, use for the early detection, like uh, using the blood or in the cervical, the vag, et cetera, in order to identify the biomarkers in the utopic endometrium or in the circulating uh, blood uh, that we can uh, have a risk prediction model uh, for those women who have a higher risk to develop adenomyosis and endometriosis. And this is why we are working on in our laboratory and it's by no means it's a straightforward and an easy job. I think our uh, interest and the devotion uh, is to, uh, to, make this pro to make this progress in the coming years to develop some markers that we can rely on to help those uh, uh, women uh, for their early diagnosis in these uh, terrible diseases. And that's the summary of my, um, our research. And uh, again, thank you very much for the EFA support in the past several years. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Shi. Um, Don Martin, Dr. Martin, do you have any specific questions that we could? Uh... Yes, there's, there's, a, there's a question in here about genetic, uh, about uh, transmission between mothers and daughters. Wow. Have you analyzed the transmission between mothers and daughters of mutations or epigenetic changes? And do you, or do you anticipate that epigenetic changes will be inheritable in this situation? Yeah, then I think that's a very good question from, uh, from the audience. I think this is really question, the answer that everybody wants to know, right? The familiar endometriosis or adenomyosis syndrome. We don't know whether what's the, um, the profile yet, but I think uh, to my personal opinion, that inherited trait may exist in certain uh, women, but we still don't know what's the transmission uh, uh, trait. So I would like to say every human disease 
coming from two parts. One is genetic, one is acquired. So adenomyosis and endometriosis are no exceptions. And uh, the reason is we have not done this yet because we are still in the early phase uh, to, uh, to elucidate, to reconstruct the genetic and epigenetic uh, landscape of the, of the lesions. So once we have those data in mind, the next step is to understand their inheritance uh, trait and uh, what kind of the germline mutations or any mutation acquired in the uteri can uh, further facilitate or increase the risk of the women to develop adenomyosis and endometriosis. So the short answer is that's a good question, but that will be in the future uh, in Denver. Hi, I think we are at the end of our time. So I do respect people's uh, weekend schedule. This session will be continued tomorrow. Dr. Shi, I, I don't have any specific question to you, but um, Aisha couldn't be with us because it's three, three o'clock early in the morning in Japan. But I am so happy and please thank you for joining us. I know you drove from Washington to New York, <laughs> hopefully not running away from the <laughs> mayhem there. Uh, well, we are really happy and we are humbled and honored for you joining us. To all thank speakers, you. Dr. Gomel, Dr. Martin, Dr. Rich, and Dr. Nezat and Tulandi, which I couldn't say bye-bye, and Watia, thank you very much. We're looking forward to see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock for our fertility uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. And for, all of, and for all of the, thank you, Dr. Dr. Shi. For all of the patients who have questions in, on the line that have not been answered, we will try to answer as many of those as possible, uh, but we will do that by email. Thank you. Okay, that's very good. Thank you, Ben. See you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.